Bibles, please, to John chapter 7. Tonight's text is, we will be covering verses 40 through 53, and the title of this evening's message is The Seed of David. In our last study in chapter 7, we were looking at the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Bible calls it that great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was a celebration, a seven-day celebration plus one. The seven-day celebration would be that which they would be in the tabernacles, their booths, their tents, and they would be in remembrance of God's provision uh, for the Israelites as they were moving through the wilderness for 40 years. Two million people being cared for by the Lord day after day after day after day. And on the eighth day of that feast, there w it would be specifically dedicated to the remembrance of God's provision of water for the, the people as they were in that journey, that 40-year journey. And I thought it was interesting. I came across a study that mentioned the fact that they have, whoever they are, uh, identified a rock, which they say, whoever they are, that this is the rock that Moses struck with his rod and water came forth from it. In Saudi Arabia, they have said, this is, the, this is the rock, this is the one. And it's, the rock itself is of no significance. That's not, it's just what people do. They'll, they'll find something and they'll start to say, this is the one, and then they get all committed to that rock or that item, and it becomes more important than what was happening at that place. And what was happening at that place? The Lord provided water for the people there, and also painted a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus as he was stricken once uh, for us and for our sake, and by him our strip, stripes were healed. The water flowing from that rock provided life for those people, and they, there came a second time where they wanted water and Moses was instructed to speak to the rock because the rock was only to be smitten once. That is, Christ was only crucified once, right? And the instructions were given to Moses, speak to the rock, these people are thirsty. And Moses, in his anger, misrepresented the Lord and struck it a second time. And that's actually what caused him to be withheld from entering into the promised land. His misrepresentation there at the rock by striking it a second time. And I think what is important for us to remember is that um, it isn't about the rock itself. It's about Jesus the rock. And what would it be like if we were to find that rock and go and strike that rock? Is water going to come forth? No, it was, it was a work of God in providing for the people there. It would be like us going to Mount Sinai and start setting bushes on fire, hoping that uh, you know, it's going to speak to us through the burning bush. It isn't necessary because he speaks to us in our hearts. Our, his Holy Spirit is in us and will speak to us, and there is no need to go to Mount Sinai to set bushes on fire or to go to Saudi Arabia and start hitting rocks. The Lord himself it dwells inside of us. And so as these people in Jerusalem, in the Gospel of John, are celebrating God's provision, 
for the, the wanderers in the wilderness, as the celebration reaches that eighth day, Jesus stands and he says to those people there, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Not go to the rock, come to me. That's where we come when we are thirsty. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I was thinking about it, and the, the English language is, isn't very sufficient for covering the Greek language or the Hebrew language. Uh, and so there are different things that happen when translating scripture. And I think what we can see here is, if anyone thirsts, is yes, that's what Jesus said, but that word if, is also can be translated since, and anyone, I think, is applicable to everyone. Since everyone thirsts, let them come to Jesus. And I think that that's important because we are born physically with a need for physical water. Without it, we don't last more than a few days. But we're also born with a spiritual need for spiritual water. And without it, we will not live in eternity with him. It's a matter of eternal destination. So it's important for us, as, as important as water, physical water is, spiritual water is more important. Because physical water is that which will preserve temporarily these physical tents that we live in. But the spiritual water, that is, being born of the Spirit, is that which gives us life forever and forever. And that is, what is more important? That which is temporal or that which is eternal? Always the eternal. And so Jesus is trying to give to the people there in the temple area the understanding that they need this living water because we are born with a spiritual thirst which is even more important than our physical thirst. So it says then in verse 39, this he spoke concerning the, the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And then our text begins in verse 40 saying, therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying said, truly this is the prophet, and others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. I was thinking through this and I thought, isn't this interesting? We are in the seventh chapter coming up on the eighth chapter here of the book of John, and this is the same question they have been asking the whole gospel. Who is he? Where did he come from? And what is he teaching? What is his teaching about? The, the question comes up again and again and again, and they should have known, they should have recognized who he is, where he was from, and why he was teaching, what he was teaching, where he would be going. It's just a constant, and it, it reminded me to point you to a couple different places. If they had, because clearly they, they have an understanding that the Messiah, the one who they are waiting for, is to come from the seed of David. He shall be someone who is a descendant of David. And if they had done any digging whatsoever, they would have recognized that that's exactly who he is. They're thinking, we know this man. He comes from Nazareth. We know his brothers and his sisters. We know his father is Joseph and his mother is Mary. How many of those things are wrong? How many of those things are not true? They're not good fact finders. They have come up with those things that they've heard, but they're not digging very deep. 
And the ones who should have known most clearly are the ones who are in possession of those genealogies. The genealogies of the Jewish people were extremely accurate and detailed and existed up until the time of 70 AD. At, at that point, they were destroyed when the temple was destroyed. But before that, there was very detailed genealogies that were being kept. And they were being kept where? In the temple. They, those religious leaders were in possession of the genealogy. All they had to do was go and look and see, okay, let's see, let's see who he is and let's see where his, what his lineage is. And because his lineage, is, what, his lineage was well detailed and written and kept, they should have understood. He is, a seed, he is from the seed of David. He is a descendant of David. This shouldn't have even been a question. Not only that, but they're thinking that he's from Nazareth because he grew up there. But that's not where he was born. He was born in Bethlehem. And they are saying, shouldn't the Messiah have been born in Bethlehem? Why is, he came from Galilee. He came from Nazareth. He can't be the Messiah. He, he's disqualified. He's not disqualified. They're, they're simply not digging into scripture that wasn't that hard to do. If, and so if you are unaware of where these genealogies are, I'll give it, give it to you here. Uh, where's the first one? Where's the easiest one to find? Matthew. Matthew, chapter one. The gospel of Matthew begins. In fact, the entire New Testament begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And how is it that they had that genealogy? because there was record of it, because it had been kept and was kept in the temple area. The Gospel of Matthew is covered, uh, it covers the genealogy of Jesus from verses 1 through 17, and it covers the generations from Abraham to Jesus. So they, if they had even looked into this genealogy, and the genealogy in Matthew is different from the one in Luke, but it's because one goes through Joseph's line and one goes through Mary's line. But both cross into David's seed. Both of them will do that. One of them, this one in Matthew, begins at Abraham and says, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob. And it goes through this line and generation to generation, descendant to descendant, until it gets to it gets to Joseph. So this is the one in Matthew is the one that goes from Abraham to Joseph. Now, is Joseph Jesus' father? No. Joseph is his stepfather, basically, because God is his father. This is the line, but this is the line that says that he has right to, uh, to the throne. And it's, it's a word that gives to us that fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham, that from him, from his seed, all, all nations would be blessed. Uh, I might be jumping ahead of here, but uh, I, I want it to be underlined. Can God lie? He can't lie. You know, if he lies one time, then, then it's all gone. He can't lie even once. Because then how would you know when he's lying and when he's not lying? How would you determine it? He, he, he cannot lie. He never has. He never will. Everything he says is absolutely true. So if the word says that he is a descendant of Abraham and a descendant of David, then it is true. Everything that, that the Lord says and has ever said is true, and he cannot lie. In the Gospel of, Ma of Luke, in the third chapter, from verses 23 to 38, the lineage goes the other direction. Rather than working from Abraham in the past, to Jesus in the present, this lineage goes and begins at Jesus and then says his father was, and his father was, and his father was, and his father, 
And it goes all the way back from Jesus to Adam. Now, how, how clear is that? If they had only done any investigating whatsoever, they would know not only is he a descendant of David, but he's a descendant of Abraham, and like the rest of us, we're all descendants of Adam. It could have been something easily proven if they had only wanted it to be true. They just didn't want it to be true. And they, because of their desire for it not to be true, those who want a lie will propagate a lie until that lie is believed to be true. And I think we're pretty aware of how that happens. Uh, the lies, if you tell them often enough, not only do the listeners become deceived, but even the one who tells the lie over and over again begins to believe it. So that is what their, their course is. They want to preserve their power. They're, they're saying this, he can't be, he's disqualified because he's not a descendant of David and because he wasn't born in Bethlehem. That is not true. The truth is, he is a descendant of David. He is a, the seed of David. He is the seed of Abraham. He was born in Bethlehem, and uh, it was easy enough to prove it. But they just didn't want that to be so. In the Gospel of John, which we are currently in, and will probably be in until the Lord comes for us, it begins, that gospel begins in what way? Before Adam. Not only does the genealogy go back to Adam in the book of Luke, but John begins it before Adam. The first verse in the gospel of John is, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. The Word is Jesus. He was in the beginning with the Father and with the Spirit, and that is prior to creation, the creation of the heavens and the earth, and prior to the creation of man, and everything that, are, that is created, God always was, and Jesus always has been, is, and always will be. There is no beginning or no end to him. They, they really have no clue what that is about, and they're not going to accept that, and they're going to get it confused. I find it interesting to consider how quickly um, people get confused. You ever noticed how quickly? In a single generation, you have Jesus returning to the right hand of the Father, and within a generation, there are all kinds of bad doctrines going on out there that Paul has to combat because of the fact that there are so many people out there that are coming up with conclusions that are not true because they have a hard time believing that all things are possible with God. And that surely he couldn't have left the right hand of the Father in and become uh, flesh. How can God be in flesh, which is not pure and holy, and yet remain pure and holy? God can do anything, can't he? Is there anything God can't do? There isn't anything. Well, he can't lie. Okay, he can't lie. And so bad doctrine will come up. I, I was listening to somebody who was talking about being approached by uh, those who have bad doctrine who go door to door and try to convince people of things that are not true, things that are not scriptural, uh, that basically will show up you know, without identifying who they might be. They might be bicyclists in suits and, you know, it, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Who am I talking about? Jesus, the what? Mormons. Yeah, Mormons and, and <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah. So they will come to the door. And I used to, I used to be really concerned about that. And I, I thought, you know, I don't want to get into any kind of scriptural battle with uh, somebody who's really come to the door with the intent of battling. And I am not, I, that is not me anymore. If somebody wants to come and talk, I, I will talk. What I won't do is argue. Because there are times where people will have 
come and they, they are all about want, wanting to fight. And they have no intention of listening. They, their whole intention is to um, basically corner you, humiliate you, and, and hopefully convert you. I'm not interested in that. But if somebody wants to talk, and if they're willing to listen, then I'm willing to talk. And, and I think it's a good thing. I, I, I look forward to that kind of a conversation if somebody wants to talk. But as soon as they start to argue and um, in, enter into, and I have had people call me on the phone and start to go down that road. It's like, sir, I, I know you're not, you're not here to learn. You're not here to, you're not looking for an answer to a question you have. You have come here prepared to fight, and, and I'm just not interested in doing that. Fortunately, with a phone, it's a lot easier. You just go, beep, and you're gone. But um, if, they're not, if they're not willing to listen to the truth, then, then it's probably one of those situations where, you know, I don't call people swine, but it, you, you put pearls out there, and they're just, they, they have no intention of, of doing anything with it other than trampling on it. So, when it comes to the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you can go and you can trace it, you could trace it all the way back. And fortunately, in Scripture, we have the two genealogies, right? They survived the uh, tearing down of the temple in 70 AD, so it can still be seen. Evidence is evidence, and there are all kinds of evidences of the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. You take the prophecies, the 300 prophecies or so, and you start to disqualify huge portions of population from the possibility of being the Messiah, and by the time you've get, gotten to the eighth prophecy, it's already down to, it can only be one person. And yet still, people, they're not, they're not interested in the evidence. Because evidences are that which convince the mind. Salvation comes in the heart. And it is something that you need to be, we need to be praying about, right? Yes? If prayer is, is what uh, we ought to be doing uh, constantly and regularly, without ceasing. That God would melt the hearts of people, that they would be willing to listen to the truth, and then willing to receive the truth, and that they would be saved by the truth. And, and that's what Jesus is about. So, you have here, these people who are, they are making mistakes, factual mistakes, and coming to factual uh, uh, mistakes in their conclusions, and as a result of it, they're not in that place of even believing that Jesus is qualified to be the Messiah. And so there's a division among the people. And some of them wanted to take him but no one laid hands on him. What do they want to take him for? The laying on hands is not for the purpose of blessing here. They want to take, lay their hands on him and take him and put him to death. That's, what there's, that's what's being spoken about here. But no one did lay hands on him. And then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? And the officers said, no man ever spoke like this man. So the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers, sent the police, the temple police, to go and arrest Jesus, to take him, to bring him to them, and they come back with empty hands. And the chief priests and the Pharisees are, what happened? I, why did you come back without him? And their answer to those chief priests and Pharisees is, no man ever spoke like this man. So their hearts are being melted. They're listening, and they're listening to the truth that Jesus is speaking in the temple. And because of that, they conclude, at minimum, we're not taking him. We're not bringing him back. And the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Now, who's deceived? Do you, do you find it interesting to hear people that basically are the deceivers accusing others of being the deceived when it's them who's doing the deception? Did you follow that? Did you follow that? 
Yeah, they're, they're by, in deception. They are, and now they're saying, are you believing the, the deception that he is giving? And Jesus is speaking the truth, and they are speaking the lie, and they are shaming these, uh, these people uh, endlessly and saying, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? Look, you know, look at these, these religious leaders. Nobody from the religious leadership is believing him, so you know, why would you believe him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, the, uh, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? And they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Is that the truth? That is not the truth either. There was a prophet who came out of Galilee before uh, this time, and his name was Jonah. You ever hear of Jonah? He came out of Galilee. They are giving to, these religious leaders are making one mistake, telling one lie after another, and Nicodemus says, our law says we can't do what you're doing. You're breaking the law by accusing him without even hearing him or knowing what he's teaching. You can't do that. The law says you can't do that, and yet you're doing that. And so they attack Nicodemus. They said, Nicodemus, are you deceived by this man too? Are you a Galilean? Is that why, you know, he's, he's one of your homeboys? Is that, what was it, what's going on here? Nicodemus, you're a respected ruler in the, in the Sanhedrin. Are you being deceived as well? It's sad to see how people who desire to have power hold power and not lose the power that they have been holding, what they will do to the people around them, no matter who they are, is that not the most selfish thing that you've ever heard? Jesus will say, you are blind, and you are leading others into blindness. I've come to give to them eyes to see. Jesus is from heaven. Yes, he was born in Bethlehem. Yes, he was raised in Nazareth. Yes, he is from the Galilean area. But he's God himself. He speaks truth. Can he lie? Can Jesus lie? Did Jesus tell a lie at any point? When he broke something and Mary said to him, Jesus, did you break this? He did not say, well, I don't know. He knew, and he, had, he confessed, right? I, yeah, I broke it. If something happened, did he ever point to his brother and say, he did it. You know, I've been, I've been a brother a long time. I know what that looks like. I know what trying to get out of things looks like. I don't know. I've told this before, it's really embarrassing. Um, I almost burnt the house down once. I was fascinated by a Bic lighter, and I, I thought, choo, choo, look at that thing go, and I turned it up as far as I could. I was probably eight. I turned it up as far as I could go, and I, but I didn't want, my uncle was home, uh, I didn't want him to see what I was doing, so I went underneath the, the bed yeah, and you know how fast the, the thing underneath the bed goes? It's like toilet paper. It goes poof, and it's like, and I went, uh, I went running out there, and, and I said, the bed's on fire, and he's like, ah. And, and he came back there, and he flipped it over, and, and he got it out, he, he, but I'm thankful that he did. When my parents confronted me with this, you know what my answer was? Oh, I think somebody must have broke into the house and did that. <laughs> I wasn't the sharpest 
liar and and you know, can you imagine what they were thinking in their minds? But I stuck to my story. I was like, I'm not giving up on this. I'm and, and you know what? Jesus never told a lie. Everything that he has ever said or done is absolutely true. And he said, if anyone thirsts, come to me and drink. If anyone, we are all thirsty. That's why we open worship this morning or this evening. With, uh, come to the fountain, right? Come, Lord Jesus, come. All who are thirsty, we're thirsty. We have a thirst for Him. And He said, "Come, and and I will give you water, living water, and it'll flow into you and through you, and it will be a blessing to you and to the, those around you, and it will be a blessing to Him." It doesn't mean you know, that we will never be thirsty again, but we will never have a thirst for a Savior, for a different Savior, only Him. He is the only one. He is the fountain that we come to. I used to, I used to hear something about, I want, to, I want to find myself camped underneath the spout where the blessings flow out, right? I want to be underneath that spout where just the blessings keep coming and that living water keeps getting poured in. Um, I don't want to be thirsty again. I, I've been, we, we were born thirsty, right? What's, what's the thirstiest you've ever, is that a word, thirstiest? What's the most thirstiest you've ever been uh, physically? I don't know that I've ever gone a whole day without drinking something. Um, I clearly never did two days. I, I know that didn't happen. Can you imagine the need on, at the level for that living water? We are born with that, that need. In this room, we have all tasted and seen that the Lord is good. One of my favorite pictures, actually we have a picture of it, is... Uh, the picture of what's to come is that I'm looking forward to camping out next to the river of life and to be underneath that tree that's got its roots in, in that water that it never, that flow never stops going into that tree. I used to do a lot of backpacking and one of the places that I remember setting up the tent that was the most beautiful place I've ever been was up in the Sierra Mountains in California next to a crystal clear lake. In fact, I think it was called Crystal. Or no, it was called Mirrors. There were two of them. They were mirror lakes. And just being right there next to that water. And just, oh, I'm looking forward to being camped out next to the river of life. And you can have, you know, Hawaii or wherever you want to be. You know, uh, I'm, I've got the river of life. That's me. And I'm looking forward to it. And we have that <laughs> river of living water flowing into us and through us because of our relationship with Christ. We don't have to strike the rock. We just speak to the rock, right? The rock of our salvation. We speak to him. Say, Lord, I'm thirsty. And he'll give us water. And he said, all you got to do is ask. And, and that's for us to do. Isn't that awesome? He says, if you're hungry, I'll give you bread from heaven. If you're thirsty, I'll give you living water. What else could we want uh, other than to see him face to face? And that, that's coming. That is coming very soon. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you that you have given to us Jesus your only son, and that is as you have given to us life through and with and for Jesus, we pray, Lord, that we would not take that for granted, that we who once were thirsting and didn't know where to come and drink, you brought us to that well of living water, and then you gave to us that taste, and then you began that flow that goes 
comes from above and into our hearts, and then we pray, Lord, flows through our hearts to those around us. We don't want to be a lake uh, where everything just kind of ends right here. We want to be a river where your living water flows through us to those around us. We pray, Lord, that we would be those vessels that you have fashioned and that we would, within the vessels that you have fashioned, carry the living water. And that what you, whatever you tell us to do, we would do it. Wherever you tell us to go, we would go. Whatever you tell us to say, we would say. And if those who come up to us are carrying with them a lie, and they want to find the truth, or if you brought them to us in order that we can share the truth with them, then we pray, Lord, that we would have that boldness and that we would be a people who, when we see those who are being deceived, would give to them the truth and to do so in love, that we would be a people who live and love the way that Jesus showed us how to do that and that in doing so, you would be glorified in us and through us. We are the work of your hands. And for this and for the promise of those things that are to come, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for one last song. thank you that in that moment where we surrendered to your love, you moved in, you laid the foundation, you have been doing that work ever since of building our lives and making them more like yours, that we would be able to and equipped 
to do the work of the saints as you send us out to those places and to those people that you know need to hear the truth, the gospel, that Jesus is the promised one, is the Messiah, is the Christ, that there is no other name by which any can be saved. And so we lift up the name of Jesus, we love the name of Jesus, we proclaim the name of Jesus to those around us that they too may taste and see how good you are, the gift of salvation that you offer to all, and the promise of your coming to get us and take us home. We thank you and we praise you for all that you do every single day as you continue to do that work in us and through us for your glory. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.